Hello everyone. Thanks for joining me today. How are y'all doing? So I'm working this afternoon on this painting here. It's about maybe a quarter of the way done at this point. Still got a long way to go. And it's one of the pieces for my upcoming show at Haven Gallery in May. In fact, this is probably going to be the final piece that I have time to create for that show because my next step after this is going to be to create the frames and do a lot of resin work and then get them shipped out. And because the show actually starts in the beginning of May, I need to ship stuff by mid-April at the very latest. So really, there's not that much time left for this. So I'm really happy I managed to get four pieces of this particular mini-series done in time. I have about 20 pieces total for the entire show, but last month I struck upon a concept that I was really enjoying and that suddenly sparked a whole slew of ideas. And the only thing bad about this was that it happened so far along in the process of creating work for this show. So I didn't really have a whole lot of time left to explore the idea as much as I would like to, unless I really, you know, put my head down and just got to work with it. So that's what I did. And I had myself pretty much scheduled for nothing else with due dates this month, with a couple of little exceptions. And I basically told myself, okay, I got one week for each piece that I want to do in this set. And if I do that, I can do four of them. So I, I almost hit that goal. <laughs> I fell a little behind on the third piece and then dealing with figuring out all my tax paperwork because, you know, it's that season as well right now. That kind of intruded as well. And so I got a little bit delayed. But I'm far enough along on this piece that I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to mostly finish it. I'm probably going to get about halfway on this one and then shift over to um, doing the frames because that's going to take about two weeks or so for, you know, after I design them. I have to design them first and then it takes about two weeks and then they get shipped out to me or I go pick them up. And so with that time frame, you know, while I'm waiting for the frames to arrive, I can finish up this painting. So that's my plan currently. All right, I think that we've got enough people joined in here now. Thanks again everyone for coming to hang out with me. And so I did something a little different this time leading up to this live stream. I asked if anyone had questions that you wanted me to address when I posted in my Instagram yesterday about the timing for this. Here, I'm gonna zoom in over here. So, what was I saying? Oh yeah that I, when I posted yesterday about the timing for this stream, 
I also left a little window where you could type in questions if you had for me to answer. So you know, some of those people might not be here right now, but I thought that would be a neat way to let everyone get involved even if they can't actually show up at the live timing of this. So let me uh, start going through some of those. And yeah, if you have other questions, you know, in the audience right now, if you have stuff that you think of on the fly here, feel free to throw those in as well for me to get to. Marla is asking, how do I get the texture on the wall here? The stuff that was done using, let's see, geophyte and, let me think, what else was that one? It was that one, Tiger's Eye, Daniel, those are both Daniel Smith, although I think I was using, um, I think I was using Roman Sesmol geophyte. It's a really gorgeously granulating pigment, and that's what gives it the mottled texture here. And then this, these blooms along the wall as well. Let's see if I can move the painting over so you can see it. There you. So this stuff over here, that was created by dropping water onto the paint as it was still wet and then just leaving things to dry. So you don't want to mess around too much with your brushwork once you lay in the pigment because that's going to interfere with the granulation and the spreading of the pigment into these cool textures. So a lot of it is just like dropping the paint there and then stepping away from it. But I do that as my base texture. And then from there, I go and I start doing a lot of dry brush, a lot of glazes and dry brush to build up detail and things like this. So this all started like that stuff over there on the left side. So this part, I haven't yet gotten around to working on, working up details and things. Yeah, the tiger's eye and geothite they they granulate really well. Like I am really astonished when I just brush it across my page and they, it instantly starts to granulate. So it's pretty cool like that. And having a combination of them gets a little bit of variation of color. So that's why there's there's a little bit of a more um, greenish tone even over here. I think that's more the tiger's eye. Not not quite green, but it's like tilted towards there. Whereas the geothite is very warm yellowy, sunny look to it. Do I read fantasy science fiction novels? And would you take any inspiration from them for a theme of work? Yeah, I read a lot of fantasy and sci-fi. These days, more sci-fi than fantasy. I, <laughs> when I was younger, I used to hate sci-fi. <laughs> and, and they only read fantasy back then. And these days, it kind of seems to have flip-flopped so that I do more of the sci-fi side of things instead. I don't generally use that as inspiration for my paintings, though. Uh, more often what would happen is, is my inspiration is kind of sourced from the same place that a lot of fantasy and sci-fi comes from. So mythology and folklore and things and I always come back to that whenever people ask me what's my inspiration a lot of it is mythology folklore legends stories that have been told through you know through history across so many different cultures in so many different ways these are kind of the core stories that we cling to in many different forms so you know that answers also another question that I received earlier, I think Valerie, Giraffe, and Stillness in Motion both asked me where I get my inspiration from, so that's that's the answer that I, I usually have for that, is a lot of it comes from 
mythology, folklore, legends, nature, movement. Yeah, you can see that here. This is this is nature breaking through the patterns that are that you know we try to create order and and um, you know how we try to harness the randomness of nature into this organized beauty and nature can somehow just kind of break through that and also create its own kind of beauty. You know, this piece, part of what what uh, sparked the visual inspiration for this is you know, you've, seen, you've seen photos and you've probably seen it in action too sometimes of tree roots just kind of breaking through the concrete of a sidewalk and shaping the sidewalk in fact to its um it's it's very organic and and flowing movement of growth so yeah nature growth and movement those are two other points of inspiration for me And the uh, nature element also, you can see that in all the botanical artwork and painting I do. That's where it's, it's much more of an obvious um, inspiration point. And frequently what I, I like to do is I, I do botanical paintings, which are, in a way, they're, they're kind of really detailed studies of plants and the way things grow and the way things uh, it move and evolve. And, and I like to do those and that brings me in very close inspection of the subject where I really dive down deep into the patterns and the, the ways nature expresses itself in patterns from the smallest elements like the cell, um, the way cells are stacked in, in the patterns of a fruit skin to the way that leaf veins spread out across the plane of the leaf. And so the, the larger element, you know, the actual leaf or fruit or a branch or whatever it is that is in a way a study and then there's the element of you know all these little minute patterns that are found within those objects and those become elements that can be integrated in various ways into my fantasy art then you know those textures this this kind of speckled texture that I have here on the wall, you know, this stuff, it is something that I see when I look closely at the skin of a fruit, like a persimmon. It's got this kind of um, spotty texture of the cell walls. And, and so these smaller elements find their ways into my art in unexpected ways. So I, I really enjoy the botanical art for the many subtle, large and small inspirations it can provide for my more fantasy themed artwork. Am I planning to make another tarot deck? Asks an NTV bip bip. I have ideas for for decks. I don't know if or when I will get to them. I would like to someday. I, I have the Dream Dance Oracle. That's another question that someone else asked earlier. Hamvu HV is when asks when I will continue making the oral de Oracle deck. I don't know. <laughs> I have so many ideas and plans in the works and I want to do them all and so 
we'll see when they can happen. I think that coming up next, so I've got this show to finish up work on, and, and then my next gallery show isn't for another year and a half. I think that one's scheduled for Modern Eden after a year and a half after May. So I've got plenty of time for that, um, which means that in the meantime I'll have a chance to work on a few other things. And I have something that I'm really excited about that I'm going to start working on as soon as the gallery pieces are done, which I can't talk about yet, but I'm really eager to. And I, I will release information about that as soon as I can. And then there's also the coloring book that I just finished all the line artwork for. I have to still finish the cover for that. Um, the color her version of the cover at any rate. Let's see, where did I put? Oh, there it is. So here's the here's the line art version of the cover. This is going to be for a new coloring book that's coming out in November. That's a ways off. But I still need to do a painting for that. I gotta finish that up next week. <laughs> All this stuff to do. Um, <laughs> let's see, what were other questions? Do I plan on releasing another calendar for the new year? I do not have one in the works. Um, that was, the calendars were being released that I had done in the past via my publisher, my, actually the publisher of my tarot deck, Llewellyn. And I don't know if they are still doing the calendars, and I have not contracted with anyone else to do that. So as of the present moment, I do not have calendar plan. Unfortunately, they are, they're one of those things that it's, it's really hard uh, to do on your own. I mean, you can do it, but it's, it's just a lot. It's just really tricky because, well, they're dated. <laughs> So they've got an expiration, really, and so you really got to be on the ball with with getting it produced and released and and out in a timely way. And you have to be really good about estimating your time frame for the release because if you uh, if you if you overestimate how many you need, then and you got a lot of dated things on your hands. <laughs> so that's why I, I usually like to entrust that, um, that to the publisher instead to handle because they are they're good at that. They've got the distribution channels. And secondly, I, I hate, like calendars are really expensive for shipping. And I always feel really bad about that. But there's, you know, there's nothing I can do. And one way to, well, there's nothing I could do except for actually have a third party handle it because then they can they can have it on Amazon and, and stuff and then it's much more affordable as a shipping option for all of you. But when I do it, I have to unfortunately charge exactly what shipping costs, which usually is more than the calendar. And that's more than the calendar and that's only in the US I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, shipping has gotten to be really hard these days. It just keeps going up and up in cost. I feel like, you know, I've been doing this, so I've been selling my prints and things for over 20 years, and and while the cost of my prints, I feel, have kind of stayed the same, they've, they've maybe gone up at most, like 20% in, in 22 years or so, the cost of shipping on the other hand and, and that I'm talking about the cost to you know my fans the retail cost the cost for shipping on the other hand has gone up like three or four times what it used to be back then it's crazy all right let's see what were some of the other questions I have so I'm gonna alternate between the questions that people asked me earlier uh, you know when I when I had the form up on my Instagram story and the questions that are coming in now in the chat. So, and if, if you ask something and I don't get to it, 
I might not have seen it, so because the stuff kind of scrolls by fast, and I, I'm doing this on my own. I don't, I don't have anyone else helping me read the chat to make sure I don't miss anything. So if I miss your thing, my apologies, and just ask it again. Uh, so let's see, what else do I have? Uh, Shishanoa asks, when did I start drawing? I have been drawing pretty much my whole life. I have always loved creating art. You know, from the, my earliest memory, when people asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, when I was a little kid, my answer was, I want to be an artist. This actually amazes my daughter now. So she's 11. But I remember when she asked me, because, you know, she's, she was in the phase where people were asking her, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she asked me, like, what did you say? And I said, well, I wanted to be an artist. And she says, and you actually did that? <laughs> but, yeah, I knew, I knew right from the start, I always knew that I wanted to be an artist. I didn't think it was possible back then. I thought it was an impossibility. But, well, actually, no. Let me take that back. When I was a little, little kid, I thought, of course that's possible. And then I got to be, like, a teenager, and then everyone told me, no, it's not possible. And I got disillusioned about it for a while which I'll get to because that's another one of the questions that someone has asked. Um, but yeah, so I've, I've kind of drawn all my life. I, I have always, you know, I didn't, you know, when people ask, did you study art? So as a kid, you know, whenever there were options to do an art class, I would take it. You know, someone said, you can do, um, speech and debate, or you can do art. I definitely went for the art. Speech and debate actually absolutely terrified me. I I felt sick to my stomach every day when I had to do that as an elective in junior high. Oh my gosh, that was, that was absolutely hell <laughs> to my mind. But yeah, so if anyone ever gave me the option though, and they said, you know, A or B, art or something else, I always picked art. Um, you know, when there were summer programs or things, I, I picked art. And, and so I always kind of did art as this extracurricular whenever at all possible. And and then I also, you know, was constantly drawing on my own and, and doodling and painting and, and stuff. And so I didn't seriously um, begin art as a career thought though until I was oh it was past college because I, I like I said I had been told by so many people that art was just not going to be a realistic career possibility and I believed them because I had done some research and I realized okay yeah this is gonna be a really hard road to do <laughs> um you know, this is the late 90s, and internet didn't exist. And so when I looked at how to go about the path of being an artist, it seemed like such a, um, a path, such a hard path because there wasn't really any way to go about it definitively. I mean, you could try to send your portfolio to lots of art directors and, and hope someone paid attention to you or you could you could try going into a company as a graphic design grunt artist and just do a lot of non-creative visual work for a really long time and hope that somehow you got elevated to a position, you got like lucky and someone saw that you had potential for some more creative work and do that. Or the one that people always, were always throwing at me was, well, you could be an architect. <laughs> and my response to that was always, no, I don't want to be an architect. I have no interest in designing buildings. Why would I want to do that? And they said, well, you get to hold a pencil and draw. <laughs> And that just did not seem like a viable option to me either. 
And so I did, you know, I did all this research and I was thinking, this doesn't seem like it's, I mean, I know it's not going to be an easy path, but it just seemed like there was a no path for it. And, and so I, I believe people when they said, don't, don't be an artist. You can't ever make a living off that. And so I went to college and I studied software because I, I actually do like software too. I like programming. I've got a really logical brain, which likes logic puzzles. And my, my dad was in software. He was one of the early people playing around with that stuff. You know, in his day, software consisted of, of punch cards <laughs> when he was doing that in college. So he he was pretty early on in that bandwagon. And and so I got exposed to a lot of uh computer stuff and software things and toys and stuff like that when I was growing up. And so I enjoyed software. It it wasn't a non-interest to me. And so I I went to college for that. And so this kind of leads to Another question, Enorial Art asks my, about my transition from another career and finally becoming an artist full-time. So I went and studied software, and this was in the late 90s. I left college in 98. The internet was just getting started, getting heated up. I mean, it had been around, but... Even in the early 90s, it was kind of a niche thing. It was, a, it was a thing that I remember my cousins, when they started going to college, they were all excited because they're like, there's this thing, like, there's this thing called email, and we get an email account when we go to college. <laughs> and everyone was super excited about that. So, so, you know, I get to college, and I'm studying software, and I... I actually get to my fourth year and I'm, I'm interviewing with various companies and it's an amazing time to be in software and have a degree in that because dot-com stuff was heating up and going kind of crazy. This is the era of pets.com and that big old failure. <laughs> well, there wasn't a failure yet. Everyone was piling onto that. And in fact, I had I had friends in, in college who were getting offers to just leave without finishing their degree from companies who were just so desperate for employees. And they were just like, hey, if you come join us right now, like don't don't even bother finishing up your degree. Just just come over here and we'll give you this we'll give you this huge starting bonus just for just for joining us right now. And you can finish off college whenever. We'll pay for it later. We'll help you. We'll pay for your master's degree later, even. So, <laughs> so that was that was what I was coming out into, and so I had, I was in a pretty good place, except for the fact that after going to a job fair and, and getting all these offers and talking to recruiters, I came home and just started crying, and. It wasn't, I didn't even realize why at first. I was like, why am I crying? I just got, <laughs> I just had a really successful job fair experience. What's going on? And I realized at that point that, that talking to all these recruiters and, and being, and, and really envisioning my life going forward as a software programmer and only a software programmer, you know, no longer having this sort of pipe dream of being an artist to, to, to kind of sustain me like that image just made me so profoundly sad and I couldn't, I couldn't imagine it. And so that was the point when I, I just decided, okay, I gotta, I gotta figure out a plan. I have to figure out some way to turn this into a reality and to make this happen. Um, and so I, I started diving back into researching, you know, how can I make this art thing actually happen? 
<laughs> and I decided in the end to, to take one of those software jobs and to work, you know, with this, um, work in, work in software for a bit. And meanwhile, to consciously make a decision to really improve my art and to focus on concrete steps to working into uh, some kind of career with art. And I even gave myself a, a deadline of two years. It took three years. And in the end, it was actually, it was actually kind of tricky. I, I could have done it in the two years, but, but there was the safety and the security of the job that I had then by then grown into. And like I said, I did enjoy software. It wasn't something that I detested or didn't like or hated. And I had made friends and I had, you know, I had an expected, um, an, an expectation of what my life was, what could be like then with it at that point. And it wasn't, it wasn't a bad thing, but you know, there was <laughs> the tears after the, the job fair. So I knew that I still, I had to do it. And it was actually, it was actually hard though, to leave the software job. Uh, and I, I remember my, <laughs> um, my now husband, he was my friend. He was my close friend at that point, and and I met him in that software job. And so, you know, there are many. It's it's kind of strange, you know. I didn't take an art path all the way through my life, but software, in many ways, I I wouldn't change what I had done in any way because this path kind of led me across so many avenues that consolidated on where my life is now, including not just the career items, you know, like the art itself, but even all my personal, uh, my personal life. And so I met my, com I, I met my husband when I was working there. And I remember when I finally made the decision to leave software and they were trying very hard to get me to at least work part-time and take a laptop with me um, as I left and to sort of continue doing it a little bit, he told me, no, make a clean cut, step away from it, dive into the art full time because that's what you really want. And don't feel guilty about leaving this job because this is just a job and it's not one that you feel is your ultimate life goal. And yeah, we'll miss you. I will miss you. People here will miss you but this is more important. And he told me that, and, and it was his words that, you know, got me to really just shed all the last ties to that and to really dive full time into the art without fear. Uh, well, I mean, I had a lot of fear, <laughs> but without maybe without, without regrets of what I was leaving behind, you know? Um, but yeah, so how did I make the transition? The transition itself happened because I made this plan and I was like, okay, I gotta, if I'm gonna do this, do this thing that everyone has told me is impossible, I can't just go about haphazardly. I've got to have some kind of path forward that I want to create. And so part of that was starting to go to conventions. I started attending uh, various fantasy and sci-fi conventions and using those as a place to start to get my name out there and to sell my artwork. And here's, here's where the software kind of really kicked in as a super helpful thing because, and it's not something that translates now because we're in a different era. You know, now there are so many options. There's Shopify, there's Etsy, there's eBay, there's like all these options for people to create online gallery storefronts. And the thing was that when I started, there was not. And so the only artists that had a presence on the internet were people who had either some kind of experience of their own with, with creating a website and, and working online and 
you know, had the know-how and the resources to to do anything on the internet. Some you know, some of those people I know were because their their spouses were in software. Some of them, you know, one of them at least I know was because she was super into uh, bulletin, you know, garage bulletin boards when she was a teenage kid, and you know, she was creating. She was she was running a, a bulletin board out of her house, and so she had the knowledge to access the internet because of that. And then there's you know me who had my software background, and I was able to also create my website because of that. And I had a university email and website account, which is actually where I started my first website. I had it on my Berkeley uh, University student account. So this is this is what gave me an initial leg up. And, and so, like I said, this is not something that is is a repeatable thing right now because we're in a different era where the internet is just full of a lot of these tools that enable any artist now to be able to reach your audience and to access the internet. But here's the thing, things are constantly changing. You know, all these platforms, they're, there's all these algorithm games that you know we're always playing with and there's, there's always new comers to the market space. There's always some new platform. You know, the most recent thing that I've started doing was Patreon three years ago. That didn't exist back then either. But mm-hmm. being open to trying out all these new things and being ready to jump in when the opportunity presents itself, I think is super key and something that can open a window for a successful transition. For me, that successful transition happened because I happened to have this uh, know-how in a in, in, in an area that was completely different from art and that you would never have expected to provide those opportunities. And, and yet it did. So opportunity can come from unexpected avenues, I think is, is what it comes down to. And don't close your eyes to the possibilities of, of uh, you know, what skill sets you have and what you can use those skill sets to achieve. My brother has recently, and and by recently I mean in in the past five years, because he's he's three years younger than me, but five years ago he decided to leave his job as a sales, uh, as a salesperson for a bike company and a sales manager, and he, uh, has dove into creating comic art. He's Dave Law is his name if you want to check him out. But he had experience. He's he's actually got an MBA. You know, he went and studied marketing when he was in college and he did bike sales for a decade or so. And this has given him the experience and knowledge for how to negotiate and to deal with his contracts and to working with others. And so this has also been a super useful overlap for him and during his transition time period from a non-art to an art career. All right, let's see what other, sorry, that was a very long rambling thing. (laughs) I <laughs> hope I didn't bore too many of you with it. Let me see, where are we with questions? Karina uh, Earl Bar- Earlbacher Art says, do you know which colors you want to use before you start painting? Or is it an intuitive decision while you draw? It goes both ways. There are some paintings where I meticulously plot out my color schemes and others where it really just happens completely on the fly. Now this piece is one where I sort of know what general colors I want to do. Let me show you the other pieces in this series that I've done so far. So this is this is one of four pieces in a mini series that's going to be part of 
my solo show at Haven. And, and so I know in general what colors I want because I have done four other pieces for this series. So this was the first one that kind of sparked the set. And all four of these pieces are around, um, they are around frame. And they all have this wall that cuts across the bottom. It's like a little bit more than half of the page. And so each of them has that consistent element and it has the same colors for the wall and as well as the same kind of colors for the sky and background. Here, let me show you some of the other pieces. So I have three others, well, three total, including this one right here. And then the fourth one is the one that I'm working on currently. This is the second one. So because I, so the first, in the first piece, I knew I wanted a, a bright blue door. That was the element that was a must. And I knew I wanted these green gems embedded into the wall and the blue roses kind of bleeding out into white. And so those were the set colors that I had decided upon. And everything else sort of filled in the gaps then once I had those set decisions made. And I wanted the wall to contrast with the door. And so that turns into these warm golden yellow tones. And then I wanted the upper part beyond the wall to, again, be a, a contrast against the solidity of this wall. So I have this naturey element with trees and things, and I needed that to be contrasting both in the subject matter as well as the color, and so that became purple. And so once I had the first piece decided upon, that kind of set the mood for the rest of the ones in the series, and so I wanted to match that concept and that coloring scheme for all these pieces. Now there's, there's subtle differences, and there's things like this moon area has taken on this very teal, bright blue color that was a surprise for me because I initially was thinking these purple tones, but I had worked that purple into the tree, and so then again I needed a different contrast for the sky, and so that's how it became this teal color when I layered some yellow on top of the blues that I was using, and it, it made for this beautiful, uh, brilliant tone there. And then this was... The third piece. Again, I have the blue roses. And the tree astonished me even in, in the bright purple that it became because I started again with these kind of purple tones and then just somehow took on a mind of its own and built up into this very vibrant purple shade. So a lot of times it, it works like that. So I, I start off with some fixed ideas, some I, some concept of the color which is fixed in my head and which I have decided upon, and others which are sort of loose and flowing and they can react to everything else that ha I have going on. Now in this piece I had decided that I wanted the golden color wall, the sandy golden colored wall as with the others, and I needed to make sure that these crevices nicely contrasted. So that became the purple. And then I think that in response to the purple then, in response to both the, the sandy golden and the purple, I'm going to have to make this thread of roots um, have a slight bluish green tinge to it, just to have it really pop out and become a noticeable contrast against the rest of it. Now, I I talked about a lot of color decisions and things in actually the last, I think it was like the last two or three months in my Patreon. So if you're interested in hearing or reading me go on at length about color decisions and how I go about plotting out colors and, and designing and how it varies from some situations to others and, and um, in some paintings where I have a very fixed color design sense and others where it's more free-flowing. Yeah, so that's that's on my Patreon, actually. It's part of the Insights series, so I do those, like, beginning of each month. 
and that's a dollar per month if you want access to those. I, I do a lot of other technique and talk about um, my process and behind the scenes stuff as well on my Patreon if you're interested in looking at that. And there is a link to it in my bio here on Instagram. So you can check that out if you're interested. Marla is asking, did my parents or family member mentor or introduce you to art or was it just through school? I don't think um, anyone in my family really introduced me to it. In fact, like I said, my family was among those who who were um, advocating a more sensible career route. Let's put it that way. <laughs> And so I, I was always just into art. You know, as I said earlier, I was, it was just something that you couldn't keep me away from. And so I explored it at every avenue, every opportunity that I had. Although it has turned out, what's interesting is that as the decades have passed, it's, it's turned out that a large number of my family has found their way into various professional art careers. And the, the, the strange thing is that we're all in completely different uh, types of art. <laughs> there's some sculptors, there's some writers and singer and, and public art and comic book and yeah all kinds of things and the strange thing is that you know we were all told that it was not possible and yet i believe there's six six members of my extended family that have found their way into art careers of some sort now which is pretty neat all right harina artwork asks how do you get into exhibitions and can you tell, oh, there's one other. Here's a quick one I can answer. Uh, Angel J Studios asks, what, what material did I usually use to paint on? Mostly paper, hot press, watercolor, paper, 300 pound, usually. That's a quick, easy answer. Uh, Harina Artwork was asking how I get into exhibitions and can you tell us about the process and your experience? So, Galleries are are really separate from the illustration world, although there's been more and more overlap with it in recent decades. Recent decade, I should say, not even decades plural. It's it's a fairly recent thing. When I was in art school, I I had pretty much written off galleries as an avenue for my art because it was because I was so obviously interested in illustrative work and galleries were just not. <laughs> they were not interested in that and I was told so in no uncertain terms by the uh, professors in the art program that I was in because the art program at the school that I had chosen which was specifically chosen for the software program, not the art program, and therefore my art was at odds with what was taught there. Um, it was a very fine art, abstract expressionism focused setting. And so my illustrative inclinations were not welcome. <laughs> it was tough, <laughs> but I, I, I stuck with it anyway because I was just dying to do any sort of art at all. And as I had said earlier, whenever the opportunity arose where I could pick A or B and one of them was art, I chose the art. So even if it was completely not the kind of art that I was interested in, I still picked it. Um, sorry, lost track, lost the train of thought there. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about exhibitions. So at that at that point in time, I, I basically completely wrote off galleries as a possible avenue for me. And instead, I, I focused purely on, on illustration um, opportunities. And 
so um, maybe seven or eight years ago, I started getting so so you know I I went ahead with my illustrative route and I did my thing and I evolved over the past. 25 years to where you see me now but about about seven or eight years ago I started getting emails from galleries saying are you interested in joining our group exhibition and I actually deleted I actually deleted the first one I got which was from Crab Jam Studios which I eventually did work with and did three solo shows there, but there, the first email that I got from Julie, I actually just completely deleted it because I didn't, I thought, well, they must not know what I'm doing because I don't know why a gallery would be interested in me. I know that galleries are not. And it wasn't until my, my friend, Alan Williams, um, he does a lot of concept art and things, and he, I was, I was over at his place and he asked, Hey, did you get this email from Julie at Crab Jab? And I said, I think I did. I think I deleted it. <laughs> he says, yeah, there's an exhibition and, and there's some stuff in LA too, some group shows and I'm going to send my stuff into these. And so after he mentioned that, I, I went and dug through my emails again and I found those same invitations that he had just talked about. And I said, okay, maybe I'll give this a try. And, and so I, I joined a few of those as group, as part of a group exhibition. So I'll, t I'll talk about group exhibitions, solo exhibitions in a second, but that was sort of my entry into it. You know, after doing one or two of those, then I started getting more of these invitations from other galleries to be part of their group exhibitions. And after I started looking into it more, I realized, I guess, this more illustrative art is actually now welcome within certain kinds of galleries who are looking who are who are looking to um, be more of you know less of the abstract um, type of art and, and more of the illustrative type and it was a thing now which surprised me <laughs> and and so I started reading about more, you know, how to work with galleries and, and such. And I realized that what I really wanted to do then was to start building a relationship with certain galleries. So the group shows were a good way to get to know in general what these gallery um, galleries were like and, and their and their owners and their clientele and to see kind of which ones would suit me. And it was a way to sort of try them out and ex explore a little bit. And as I worked with several of these, I started narrowing down the ones that I really enjoyed working with the galleries whose, whose, uh, whose owners knew what their audience liked and how that could sync up with my work as well. And, and in additionally, there was a few of them that were within, that were located in areas that were convenient to me where I can maybe physically attend openings, which is a big part of being part of a gallery exhibit as well. So conveniently, one of them was in San Francisco, Modern Eden, and another was in New York, close to where my husband grew up. And, and then there was also Crab Jab in Seattle, who was one of the first galleries that I worked with. And they, and, and I, I love going to Seattle, and it's close enough to me here in California that it was also feasible. So I started, started pursuing more of an active relationship with these few galleries, narrowing it down, and not doing as many of the group shows, and uh, of other galleries, I mean, and focusing more on the group shows of these three galleries. And eventually... When you have a proven track record with working with a gallery and and in and they can see that you you can work with a timeline you can produce quality work that that um, you know will meet the criteria for the shows that they have and that you can work on a schedule and are good with that then you can sort of move onward in the relationship at that point and sort of pursue a solo gallery exhibition with them which is what I have eventually done with each of those three galleries. 
unfortunately crab jab is no longer um, but I am very happy with my relationship with both modern Eden and Haven and in uh, the the mutual relationship we have of me creating art for them and, and them getting it in front of people who want to see it <laughs> and also having the opportunity to show my work in person to people which is super uh, I think it's super important also because art is meant to be seen in person and that's kind of the one sad thing I think of always selling online which is primarily what I do is that people for the most part don't get to see the pieces in the way they're meant to be viewed which is in person and in in all the wonderful textural glory of watercolor and the resin and the reflective stuff that I use like the gold leaf and everything I can create approximations of that as close as I can to the reality of the physical thing when I when I digitize my art but there's really no substitute for seeing a piece in person and so I, I love having that and that's part of part of why I, I love working with galleries is the ability to share my art in person with people and having a body of work you know 10 20 pieces that are created along a theme and to share it all at once is just really satisfying and fulfilling and so i i love doing that and i love working with these galleries and so that's that's my take on that all right we're coming down to the end of an hour that's been a lot of talking that i've done <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did not make my way through all these questions and I will save this list for next time and I'll put up a little questionnaire again next time when I'm going to do it another live streaming and so if I didn't get to your question I'm super sorry I will make note of it and write it down here and also you can add it again to the list next time I don't know when next time it's going to be I'm still kind of doing these super on the fly, you know, whenever I have, I'm at the right time within the process of working on a painting. It's, so I have trouble focusing on talking at the same time, talking, reading questions, <laughs> and painting at the same time if I'm working on something and it's not quite in the, the right stage for that. Um, and by right stage, you know, if I'm in the brainstorming or color design phase of a piece, but you know, if I'm doing, if I'm doing this where I'm at the point where I'm just rendering things that have already been sketched, it's much easier for me to multitask and do all this stuff at once. And I enjoy it. I like having you guys all around and to talk and answer all your questions. So thanks again for joining me and... I will try to give at least, well, I'll try to give at least six hours notice when I do live streams in my Instagram stories. I'll, I'll mention it in something. But I hope you all have a nice day. Thank you and goodbye.